Steve Kelly. Welcome to the show, man. How uh, are I you? Really, good, good. Thank you so much for being on. Um, I did want to just start off a little bit by kind of a quick background of who you are, how you got here, what you do, that sort of thing. You Oh, for me too. Okay. Happy yeah. to. Yeah, for, um, you, for you to do it. <laughs> yeah. So who who is Steve Kelly? Right. right. And how did he get here? What does he do? Um, well, I got to got to Austin, Texas with Motorola back in the 70s as yeah. they were moving to Austin. I uh, was a Dan Noble fellow eventually at Motorola and then left and did some other startups. Eventually uh, started a company called NetSol. And it went public and then was acquired by Cisco Systems. So that's that's a nice little success story. It was a long project. What was uh, it called? Net Salt, you said? Net Solve. Oh, Solve. Okay. Yeah. And very we good. did. We were a very early MSP. And uh, so I was at Cisco for a while. And uh, toward the end of that, when I left Cisco, two or three guys that worked with me at Cisco came together and founded the company Argentil, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Yes. So I'm the founder and a CEO, but my background is certainly technology uh, from telecom through today software. That's great. So how did you, like, did you grow up loving technology? What was that like, you know, early on in your career? Like, were you, cause I personally, I was like really big into video games and computers and, you know, all that fun stuff. So tell me a little bit about kind of how you got started in technology. Well, literally as a kid, uh, my dad gave me some transistors and I had to figure out how to make it work. <laughs> and it took a long time. <laughs> it wasn't easy. Uh, so, but that got me interested in, in, in electronics and in communications. My dad was with uh, Bell back in the day. And so uh, then when I went to Motorola, I was doing communication semiconductors at Motorola. Wow. So, so you were, you were tinkering at an early age. <laughs> yes. Same. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. I've, I've always loved like computer and computer repair and all that. So, so um, that's great. Congratulations on, you know, the, the success that you've had, you know, with the sale of that, that company that went IPO. Um, so in, in regards to Argentile, um, tell me a little bit about, you know, how that, like how you got into that business sure. um, partnerships, you know, the transition from, you know, the IPO to this new company. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, while we were at Cisco, we uh, did a huge communication deployment for a big bank. Can't say who, yeah. even now. <laughs> uh, it cost about $3 million to build that environment, all software. Something went wrong with a layer of the computer stack and it had to be built from scratch again. Wow. Nobody saved any of the stuff they built it with. And so we kind of went, well, wait a minute, this is ridiculous. This is gonna happen more than once. And if people don't solve this problem, the cloud's gonna be sort of silly. So that was the inspiration of Argentil where we set about collecting, organizing and automating the way scripting is done. And all of these deployments of applications and infrastructure and stuff is done with scripting. Scripting, we think there's 100 million, 100 million hours a year spent doing scripting, clearly rich for some automation and improvement. And sure. there's sort of an assumption out there that there's too many variables involved. You can't fix this. And we, we decided to attack that assumption. <laughs> wow. So that, that's incredible. So you're, you're saving people a ton of time. Time. With your software. Yeah. Um, and so where does that typically, where does that breakdown happen? Is that from the developer's perspective? Is that from like a leadership's perspective? Is that a combination of all that? Tell me a little bit about that. Well, so, so a lot of people are familiar with the idea of agile development. Yep. And that has made big differences of making development quicker. This is not about development. This is once you've developed the software, how do you get it out in the outside world in production? And so then it has to be deployed. There's a term that floats around called DevOps, mm -hmm. uh, which is development and operations pulled together. So we're on the ops side of DevOps and automating what happens when the 
workload or application is complete, but you've got to get it out in the real world. Mm. That can typically to be deploying it in 25 different places, and all those places are slightly different. And all of that is done with scripting and pretty much done by hand. There are some efficiency tools out there, but we start with those efficiency tools and even further automate. So the other thing we do is pull all the existing tools together so that you can kind of organize them in one place. Got it. So you're helping support DevOps automation um, with your with your software. So is it a software that you guys offer at Argentina? Yeah, and it's a software as a service. I'm sorry, it's a, a software as a service offering that you would subscribe to on a per seat basis and then you use it all you want. Nice. Very good. Um, so in terms of like businesses that are, you know, early stages, startup. So I, I have several questions around this. So early stage businesses um, in terms of your, like who, who your market audience is, is it the kind of early stage companies? Is it mid grade? Is it enterprise level or is it a combination of both? And would love to know yeah. you know, how, how your company helps support different levels of businesses at, at each level, right? So this, this is sort of a for, what we would, the industry would call a Fortune 2000 tool. So it ranges from mid-range uh, up to large enterprises. And of course, one of, because it pulls together five or six existing tools and five or six is existing languages, it's sort of an organizational tool. If you have a group of 10 people doing deployment stuff, uh, they're all working in different languages and they're all handing off back and forth all the time. This allows you to, to work in the language you're comfortable with, put your stuff into our tool so that you can collaborate through it and you can go use some work from somebody else that wasn't in your language to get your piece of the job done. So there's a lot of friction cost that this eliminates in a, in a you know, medium to large organization. Very good. You seem very like passionate about solving this problem for, for customers and for, you know, for folks that you're working with today. Tell me a little bit about um, maybe a success story that you've had with uh, sure. an existing client or a customer that you're working with today. Well, we had this idea when we left, when we left Cisco and uh, played around and did some early work and filed some patents. But what really got us going is uh, we convinced the Air Force that this was something worth doing. And so we got a bunch of funding from the Air Force. That's uh, a nice client to have. <laughs> nice client. Uh, <laughs> right. Lots of military issues to deal with. You know, there's yeah. lots of secrets and stuff, but that's fine. Um, and what we did as our first piece of sort of proof of concept of the Air Force is we took some 200 hours of manual scripting and managed to execute it any way they wanted from a on-demand request to a greenfield environment in less than 10 minutes across 19 APIs. And actually, they were quite impressed by that. That was uh, putting, uh, just as a detail, putting Docker containers on Azure and AWS in any combination they decided to describe. That's incredible. Congratulations. So just to summarize, 200 hours to 10 minutes. Is that what I heard? Yes. Yes. That like, that's a no brainer, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, like why, why doesn't everybody do that? Right. Um, so that's, that's amazing. And, and, you know, for your clients that are, you know, I think the value, it sounds like the value proposition is, you know, for leadership company or leadership teams to really understand the value is saving time, which that time could then be translated into maybe more dollar productive activities or more growth activities in the business. Is that kind of, is that kind of, yeah, in most cases in this digital transformation world, uh, they're not worried about if they save a bunch of time, they'll lay off engineers. It's more like if we save a bunch of time, the engineers should go work on what's the, what they're supposed to exactly make progress. So this isn't the saving time here has multiple advantages. One is that you get based on golden copies because if you have five engineers do a task, separately they'll all get the task done but they'll do it five different ways 
Yeah. That's okay, but as an organization, you need to solidify down to the one you want to use and use it always. And then you always have the problem that the engineers have a bunch of stuff in their notebooks that they use all the time, but then they get another job and they leave and the notebook goes with them and the company's left sort of, you know, it's called tribal knowledge is lost. So this allows you to capture that tribal knowledge, not not uh, demeaning the engineer, just capturing the work he do- did so that other people can use it when he's not there. Right. Sort of like a standard operating procedure. Yes. So that if they go on vacation for a week, everything doesn't break. <laughs> exactly. Right. And, and sadly, that happens still. It does. Yeah. In every business, I think. Um, that's great. So um, would I'm curious a little bit more about you know, how, how do you differentiate yourself from competitors, right? So DevOps automation space, um, you know, I think is, is definitely a huge market to, yes. to yeah. like a huge TAM, right? And so um, it sounds like you're, you know, you do multiple industries, you kind of niche down and maybe in multiple industries, um, but I would consider this to be sort of a niche in a way, right? The DevOps automation space. Tell me even, a little bit. Of, even deployment ahead. per se is a bit of a niche. And then yes. it sort of spreads out and is all over the place. Um, the differentiation is we are platform agnostic. So our stuff will work on any cloud platform, public or private. So that goes from VMware to Google Cloud, if you want. Um, it's also um, language agnostic. And, gotcha. and that's a very big deal because engineers all have the languages they like to work in. Yeah. And if you go buy some of the automation tools that are out there, that's fine. But you have to rewrite everything in the language they use. And that could be U- YAML, Ruby. It's OK. For us, no, you bring your scripts that you do in whatever language you use. And typical might be Python, PowerShell or Bash. Uh, or Java, or I can name, name 10 more, a brand new one is Bicep. Um, and you bring them in the language you're in. And, and when we're putting these together to collaborate, we also allow different pieces of a workflow to use different languages. And so it's a way to mix languages together and, and therefore let five or six engineers collaborate together without going out of their, you know, their friendly space. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Um, I mean, like in terms of what you've built, so how long, how long have you been in business with, with this company? Well, the company was founded in 2013. Yeah. We ran out of money for a while, so we were dormant and then picked up yeah. again in earnest with the Air Force in 2019. But that's the way startups go. And yeah, uh, a lot of ups and downs in business, right? <laughs> yeah. But we were committed to the concept because we could see Again, a hundred million hours spent scripting. I think I can spend some time trying to improve that. Yeah, I'm. I'm curious. So when we when you talked about earlier, you know, in general, with you know, saving hundred hundred hours um, of time overall, where did that research come from? Where did you find kind of that that data point? Um, to- uh, well, we worked with Gartner for two years oh, wow. while Amazing. we were working with the Air Force to research this because there's some big players in this space. So if you were going to go into this space, you better have your research right. right. Um, and they would say, hey, most of these DevOps teams on the ops side, they have five to eight tools and none of them work together. So if mm-hmm. someone could come to market with a way to make them work together, that would find traction. And yeah. so... Uh, in cooperation with them, that's how we arrived at our kind of go-to-market strategy. Wow, amazing! So, what, what, um, you know, what compels you to continue to help businesses and brands with this problem that you're solving? It's a major problem, right? Um, so, what, what kind of compels you to keep going to help to continue to help businesses grow and help them save this time with your with your brand? Well, we we you know we developed a lot of it with the Air Force, which was tremendously helpful. So now we're talking to the Air Force, we're talking to the Army, we've got some inroads maybe with the Marines. So there's a whole thing going on on the military side. You can imagine they have this problem in spades because some of their stuff is a bit older. Uh, They have trouble updating it and and they need the organization because they're a big organization. 
at this point, we've introduced the commercial tool. And so we're ready to start taking that to the commercial market. And we're working with customers to, to start to utilize it. What's our ultimate goal? Well, we're trying to make money and sell the company, I would assume. But uh, yeah, yeah. you don't think of that every day. You think of that more in the long run. Well, I mean, I think it's smart strategically that you're leveraging this big client, the Air Force, to then, you know, maybe get referrals from them to help solve the problem elsewhere in the government, you know, I guess government contracting space, maybe. Yeah, um, government, but yeah, it's applicable in the agencies as well. It's not just military, but. Uh, right. Yeah, that's um, smart. That's really so one thing the Air Force told us is that two thirds of their spend is on the op side, not on the dev mm. side. And so they do recognize it as a monstrous problem. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that, t- those 200 hours that you help with the air force, that could be thousands of hours across multiple branches of the military agencies, you know, probably thousands, you know, tens of thousands of hours, right. That can be saved. Yeah. So the that- 200 hours was actually a very simple example that just demonstrated the point that we had that level of automation. Yeah. How does that translate into dollars for those businesses? So number of hours saved versus, you know, so money. We have, so we have three case studies, uh, one with Dimension Data, one with Hewlett Packard, and one with Microsoft Partners, where we've reduced the deployment time by 90%. And so that means that they can do things faster which sort of means they could do more of it. Uh, it's, a, it, you know, the, I'll say this, the first time you use our tools for the first specific deployment, you won't save a lot of time, but it's the second time you do it because you made it all reusable. And then you can save 50, 60, 80, 90% of the time and just do more of them. So Amazing. we're looking for uh, partners and and in customers that have tasks that they do somewhat repetitively. And then there's a good place to spend time automating and let's get it right the first time and then use it a hundred times. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So the early stages of the business, um, I'm, I know we're kind of like wrapping all the way around back again, but, okay. I'm, but I'm curious around um so you did the market research to identify the issue, right? To identify the problem. You said, hey, we have a solution here to solve this problem at a massive scale for businesses and brands. Um, how do well, you we say- kinda, I'll stop you there. Like we sort of came with an idea of a solution and then we had to go figure out whether the problem we were solving was big enough. It turns out it was. <laughs> That's good. That's good because a lot of businesses have to pivot multiple times. Right. And, and it sounded like you were spot on. So- Congrats. I mean, very, <laughs> very, very few business owners can say that, right? Can say like, hey, we did the research and we found product market fit really quick, right? Yeah. Um, so that's that's amazing. How do you stay on top of um, topics, you know, like, you know, new topics like AI and machine learning? Like, tell me a little bit about, um, I'm assuming that you have some, you know, AI and machine learning built into yep. the platform, which is great. How are you staying on top of those things? What resources do you typically read um, books or articles or websites that you that you dive deep into? Well, to somewhat, I let the technical guys keep up with that <laughs> stuff and explain it to me. <laughs> and that's very frustrating that. for them <laughs> sometimes. Um, but it's a, it's a good synergy. But they look at things like Reddit. You know, there's a lot of technical information there. Uh, there are scripts all over the Internet. Uh, again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an intellectual property that people don't keep much track of. So you can find articles and information in, in tech rags and everything else. Um, I'll go to the AI question for a minute. So the fundamental thing that makes our product work is the fact that we can take an existing script that somebody wrote and analyze it first to separate it into its command structure and its value structure. In other words, there's do this to that, do this Mm -hmm. to that. Well, we can, using machine learning, separate those things into two separate things and give you a template of all the that's and a 
recording of all the do this is and and then you can sort that uh, that template into the things that will change from job to job and those that will not change from job to job. Once you have that, and I know that's pretty techy, but once you have that, you can build a library that is reusable because it has, here's the list of things you're gonna change when you reuse it, and but the library stays the same, the do that, right? And now you build libraries that take care of functional steps and then that, that's the hard part. The easy part is then you have a workflow tool where all you do is drag and drop the piece that you want to use into the workflow tool and build a workflow. And it automates. Yeah, and it then automates you compile it. the data into it, download it, and go run it. Amazing. Awesome. So I know we're a little bit close to time here. I want to respect okay. your time, Steve. Um, is there anything else that you would like to mention before I ask my final question? Sure. I'll, I'll talk about the other place we use AI is you can take that same script. See, we don't believe you can write scripts with AI. You can get close, but close doesn't work in scripting. It has to be perfect. Right. What you can do is take a script that someone else wrote and use AI to describe in English what that script was written for. And that's one of the things we're working on. So that's that's kind yeah. of how AI plays into our space. I noticed that because um, AI is basically just like a, a bunch of stuff that has already happened, right? It's just like a combination of information and data that's already been created. So it's just referencing stuff that already exists. So in terms of scripting, that makes sense, right? You can you can kind of insert that and say, hey, here's a script, give me, give me a synopsis of what this means and does. And then that way you, the, the technical team can then leverage that information to make it better for them on their end. And, and make it then make it reusable for them. But if you try to go the other way, first of all, all these languages have tons of syntax. Mm -hmm. And so you have to parse by letter, by character, not by word. And, and, right. it, and it's hard to make it work. Very hard. Right. So that's yeah. where we are today. Great. Well, hey, Steve, thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, what is the best place for listeners to reach out to you? Do you have a preference on um, maybe, you know, a LinkedIn or a website or whatever, whatever call to action? LinkedIn works fine. Our, our, our website is www.argenteal.com and you can sign up for a free demo there or you can get more information and contact us that way. Um, and from there, we'll, we'll show you a demonstration of the tool and talk with you about how it applies to your specific problem. So Perfect. I'll close with just a tagline. So our, as I said before, it's deploy any technology with one methodology. So this is useful across the entire stack, all the way from bare metal to application configuration at the top. That's why it's such a good organizational tool. And the mic has been dropped. <laughs> Amazing. So I'll stop recording here.